All right. Well, I want to welcome everyone to this Kairos Leadership Seminar, um, a special edition for the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. This event is part of the second Climate Action Week that Kairos is hosting this year. And we're so glad to have you all here. Um, this is a monthly gathering with a smaller group of people, but we're glad to have additional people with us here. And for this special edition, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Beth Lormer, to do further introductions. Beth. Great, thank you, Shannon, and welcome everyone. Good to see familiar faces and new faces in this space. Um, before we begin, I'm just going to uh, start us off with a land acknowledgement. And I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathering today on the traditional territories of Indigenous people across Turtle Island and beyond. Uh, we pay respect to the traditional guardians of the land upon which we live, work, and play. I acknowledge that I am joining you today from the traditional unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people on the banks of the Kichisibi, also known as the Great River or Ottawa River. We acknowledge that Indigenous peoples are the traditional guardians of Turtle Island on the land also known as Canada. We recognize their long-standing and ongoing relationship with this territory, which includes unceded and traditional land, and acknowledge our duty to walk with and alongside reconciliation and decolonization efforts. At this time, I invite you to take a moment uh, to place your feet on the ground as you are able, and take a moment to acknowledge the territory where you are joining us from today. Thank you for taking that moment of grounding. Um, uh, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, you will have seen that um, or heard uh, the, that the event is being recorded. Um, so we will be uh, sharing that out um, after uh, today's session. Um, and we just ask that you keep yourself muted during the presentations. And then of course, when we come into the question and discussion period, um, please feel free to use the raise hand function or um, just raise your hand visually. I think I can see everyone on the screen today, so um, uh, we'll call on you that way. Um, and yeah, I just, I thank you for for joining us today to kind of further the conversation around the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty um, in Canada and um, uh, within the Kairos network and Canadian churches. Um, Kairos endorsed the treaty in 2020, um, just recognizing its significant potential in building momentum for fossil fuel phase out. And so we want to kind of build on that momentum um, as, a, as an endorsing organization, but also recognize the growing momentum within um, faith communities uh, over the, the kind of history of its life, this the treaty initiative's life. Um, and uh, we know that the conversation around just transition and fossil fuels uh, phase out in Canada has its unique challenges. Um, and I, I see a role for communities of faith to advance that conversation as I think we're best positioned to um, connect with people and approach the conversation from a, um, a place of values. And so um, I hope that uh, we all can kind of feel uh, um, equipped after today a little bit to um, maybe advance this uh, um, initiative, this idea of the treaty in our own communities. Um, I think with that, I'm, uh, there's maybe some more context to share later, but I think with that, I'm just going to um, introduce our guest speaker, uh, who is the Reverend Rachel Mash. Um, she's going to open us with a bit of a, a prayer and, and moment um, before she gets into her conversation, but I think I want to hand things over to her now to kind of do that piece. Um, and I'm just grateful that she was she is joining us today. Um, she is based in Cape Town, so she's a few hours ahead of uh, of all of us. And uh, Rachel is the environmental coordinator for the Anglican Church of Southern Africa, um, which is uh, South South Africa, Eswatini, Lesotho, and Namibia, um, I believe. 
um, and she works with the Green Anglicans Movement. Um, she is also the secretary of the Anglican Communion Environmental Network and recipient of the Cross of St. Augustine for services to the Anglican Communion for raising awareness of the urgent need to implement the fifth mark of mission um, in the Anglican communi Communion. Uh, so I'm going to pass things over to Rachel now. Thank you so much again for being with us. Thank you so much, Beth, and wonderful to be with you this uh, morning, afternoon. Um, before I start, I thought it's important that we look at the context of where we are, and um, I'm sure we've all been very impacted by the terrible flooding that took place in Libya, um, where two dams burst, and I thought let's just set the scene by holding in our hearts the, um, the people of Libya at this time, if Beth can show us the video. Thank you. جبال الاقصار قصت ثلاثة ونص أربعة على ربعك في قبل أمطار أمطار غزيرة ونيم وقاعدين في مساكننا وقاعدين في أمريكا قاعدين في مساكننا ولي لكن قصت ثلاثة ثلاثة ونص كي كثر الأحصار وكثرة الريح الريح كانت كثرة الريح هذه حلنا الرواج بعد ننسك في العمارة الآن في هذا البلد دورة ساعة مع لا حلت الرواج نبحثنا طبعا أول ما جملنا جم الأحصار اللي جاء سيارة كبار وعائلة وسيارة لا الأحمر ضي ضو ما مش نيه ضو في المية العلو رجع المبنى طبعا المبنى هذا المبني اللي أنا قريب ثلاثة متر العمارة نحن اللي في الدور اللي عندي قريب الدور الثاني تلقوا تعليمات بعض المناطق بالاخلاء وما ما في ناس ما استجابتش طبعا خذت الموضوع ببساطة فتفاجأنا الساعة تسعة مساء بأن العاصفة اشتدت بصراحة وتمت رياح وأمطار قوية جدا ونسبة سقوط الأمطار كانت سبعة وتسعين في المية على مدينة درنا حسب حالة الطقس وبعدين سمعنا الانفجار دخل على على منطقة البلاد الناس طبعا راقدة الأغلبية كانت نايمة فهمت ما فيش حد كان مستعد لكن الله غالب شيء صار نبي دي بالنسبة لي أنا على جنب الوادي بالضبط على طريق الرئيس بتاع الوادي من قبل مسجد الصحاب فقط منزل العائلة كاملة نحنا جيران بعضنا عرفت عدة منازل جنب بعضنا عائلة سجيب فقدنا عن تو ثلاثين شخص ثلاثين شخص من عائلة واحدة ما جيناش ولا واحد إلى الآن عدد الوفيات اللي حاليا في القسم هذا بالذات 1700 وفاة إلى الآن إلى الآن كيف تم حصرهم؟ نحصر فيهم موجودين قاهم قاعدين في الممرات صوروه تم دفن كلهم اللي يتعرفوا عليه يدفنوه اليوم عشان الناس في بعض الناس لم يتم التعرف عليهم بدينا نصوروا فيهم نحط فيهم في أرقام وندفنوا الجهة الثانية يصوروا ويأخذوا في أرقام ويدفنوا دفنوا 500 واحد الجهة الضفة الثانية الأمور سيئة جدا مستشفى متهالك the initial numbers we are getting from the Libyan Red Crescent uh, about uh, uh, missed people all over the five cities, it reaches up to uh, or very close to 10,000 persons reported missing. Uh, so it's very likely uh, that the number uh, uh, declared from Derna authorities could be close to the correct number. Uh, this is uh, to be confirmed, as I mentioned earlier, uh, upon the uh, finalization of the assessment process uh, however the number would i i would expect uh, that the number would be very close to the correct one
ولا حتى الأدوية ولا حتى المعدات ولا حتى الدكاترة ولا حتى سيارة الإسعاف الحمد لله ممكن فات تو ال 400 سيارة إسعاف اللي هو مشهور عند المشكلة في انتشال الزتت من البحر وهذا قاعدين حتى البحرية الليبية وبعض الغواصين وبعض الضفادع البشرية قاعدين يحاولوا كل جهدهم في انتشال الزتت طبعا ضحايا ان شاء الله ربي يستر ما زال ندوروا على الضحايا قاعدين لكن نتمنى من فزع الشباب الليبيين اللي عنده اي 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 شهاده ولا اي علاقه بالطب يعني يجي يساعدنا فهمت يعني نحن صار معناها في نقص التمريض شباب يعني تبذل في مجهود ومستحقين الشباب بتاعنا تمريض باش يجوا يساعدونا والخيره في مختاره الله وان شاء الله الله سبحانه وتعالى يغفر لهم ويسكن لهم فسيح زمنات ان شاء الله وان شاء الله يا ربي يلم الشمل على البلاد وبارك الله فيهم طرابلس ومصراته وزيطن وليبيا كلها وطن واحد Just hold a moment of silence. Remember those who've lost their loved ones, those who are hunting for loved ones. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. That is the context of climate change. More and more extreme events, more and more devastations, more and more heartbreaking stories from different parts of the world. So as we center ourselves, I'd like to start with the season of creation prayer. Creator of all, from your communion of love, life sprung forth like a mighty river, and the whole cosmos came into being. On this earth of overflowing love, the word was made flesh and went forth with the life-giving waters, proclaiming peace and justice for all creation. You called human beings to till and keep your garden. You placed us into right relationship with each creature, but we fail to listen to the cries of the earth and the cries of the most vulnerable. We broke with the loving, flowing communion of love and sinned against you by not safeguarding the earth. We lament the loss of our fellow species and their habitats. We grieve the loss of human cultures, along with the lives and livelihoods that have been displaced and the many that have perished. And we ache at the sight of an economy of death, war and violence that we have inflicted on ourselves and on the earth. Open our ears to your creative, reconciling and sustaining word that calls to us through the book of scripture and through the book of creation. Bless us once again with your life-giving waters so that the creator spirit may let justice and peace flow in our hearts and overflow into all creation. Open our hearts to receive the loving waters of God's justice and peace and to share it with our suffering brothers and sisters and all creatures around us and all creation. Bless us to walk together with all people of goodwill so that the many streams of the living waters of God's justice and peace may become a mighty river over all the earth. In the name of the one who came to proclaim good news to all creation, Jesus Christ. Amen. So can you see my screen fine? So we're facing a climate emergency. I'm always very struck by these posters that come from the young people. And this was one from one of the marches that said, you will die of old age, but your kids will die from climate change. And we know that the earth is warming because of our use of fossil fuels and oil, coal and gas. But it's not only our emissions that are heating the planet. There's something else is happening. 
The rising temperatures are setting in motion Earth's own natural warming mechanisms, and we are entering a vicious cycle where warming is leading to more warning, warming. Scientists call these feedback loops, and we are nearing the tipping point when they will become irreversible. Of all the carbon dioxide we produce, plants take up a quarter, the ocean absorbs about a quarter, and the other half goes into the atmosphere, warming the planet. But as the forests are destroyed and the oceans warm, the percentage that nature removes is shrinking. With our forests, trees pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, storing carbon in branches, trunks, leaves, roots and soils. This is called a carbon sink. And when they burn or decay, the carbon they have locked away in their entire lifetime is released back into the air. We've been praying for you guys over the last few months and, and just seeing the devastating seams of, of loss of homes, loss of livelihoods and the devastation that you've been suffering. But another effect of all these wildfires is the incredible amounts of carbon dioxide that are being released into the atmosphere. And rainforests as well, like the Congo and the Amazon, are vitally important to the health of the planet. The Amazon itself is 2 million square miles and it covers nine countries. And in the last 50 years, almost 20% has been lost, mostly to slash and burn for farming, triggering fires, insect pests and tree diebacks. So then we get the feedback loop. The weather becomes hotter and drier. We get more drought, more trees die, more CO2 is released. And so the temperature rises, it becomes hotter and drier drought increases, more trees die, and it becomes this vicious cycle or feedback loop. Now, another very scary feedback loop is what we call albedo, which just means, means mirror. So at the North and South Pole, snow and ice are like a mirror, reflecting the sun's rays back into space, called the albedo effect. And rising temperatures are melting the snow and ice, triggering another dangerous feedback loop. At the North Pole, the winter is shrinking and the ice cover getting less and less every year. The temperature is increasing two to three times faster than the rest of the planet. As the ice melts, it exposes the dark water underneath. We are replacing ice, which reflects 85% of the heat, with dark water, which absorbs 90% of the heat. And the volume of ice in the Arctic has already decreased by 75% in only 40 years. Another dangerous feedback loop. The snow and ice melt, so there's less heat being reflected off and the temperature rises. The water gets hotter, so more and more snow and ice melt and there's less reflection and the water heats up more. We have a choice. We must take our foot off the accelerator now. We must reduce fossil fuels, we must stop deforestation, and we must regreen the earth. We can reverse the feedback loops before they become unstoppable, but the window for opportunity is very short. Climate change is not something that is simply won or lost. It is a curve that we can keep bending towards a better world. So one of those actions that we can take is the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. One of the ways to take our foot off the accelerator. And here's a picture of the General Secretary of the Anglican Communion um, signing the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. In February, we had a meeting in Ghana where the representatives from around the whole Anglican Communion in the world met, and it was agreed to sign off on the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. For me, the most important thing of the Fossil Fuel Proliferation Treaty is that the COP process is flawed. The Paris Agreement does not mention fossil fuels. The COP27 outcome did not mention oil and gas, it only mentioned coal. So we have to find a different way of moving. It's time for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty that focuses on fossil fuels and not just on reducing our carbon emissions. We recently had um, Africa Climate Week next week, and again, it was very dominated by Western voices, dominated by the, the businesses, and civil society has criticized the week for promoting false solutions like carbon trading rather than a fossil fuel phase out. 
So how are we going to phase out fossil fuels? The Fossil Fuel Proliferation Treaty has got three pillars. And the first pillar is to stop expanding coal, oil, and gas production. You need to say no to new fossil fuel projects. Um, in 21, the Anglican bishops of Southern Africa called for an immediate halt to gas and oil exploration in Africa. Now, Africa is very energy poor. Uh, in South Africa now, we are really battling uh, we, because we, we're short of, of fuel for our electricity. We're having um, uh, blackouts of up to seven hours a day. And many people across Africa do not even have access to electricity. So how can we call for a halt to gas and oil exploration? Well, often in Africa, oil itself is a curse. This book was written um, from 30, 50 years of oil in the Niger Delta in Nigeria. And if you look at the countries that have got a lot of oil, your Nigeria, or your Angola, your Mali, your West Africa countries, it really has become a curse. First of all, the profits go overseas. Oil and gas projects lead to corruption where the international com companies um, buy, buy off and bribe the politicians. It increases inequality between the super rich elite and the rest of the country, leads to political instability, vast amounts of environmental pollution in the local communities. And currently we are facing a rush for Africa's gas as European mostly and other countries are trying to um, shift away from Russian gas and they're seeing Africa as the new place to go for gas. And this is another wave of colonialism where the European countries are wanting to come and extract from Africa, leaving all the problems behind. Example is a small uh, country of Gabon. You might have heard that there was a coup after the same president was the president for 56 years. It is a tiny country. Um, they only have 2.4 million people. But they, they, they have a lot of oil and manganese and the gross domestic product per capita is $8,600. So people should be living a reasonable um, quality of life. But over a third of the population is currently living under the poverty threshold of $5 a day. So where does the rest of the money go from all this wonderful oil money that they've got coming in? The ousted president and the ruling elite have assets worth hundreds of millions of euros and dollars in France and other countries, while 900,000 900, people live in poverty. In such a tiny country with such a small number of people and a vast amounts of oil, it's not making any difference to poverty. In fact, it is increasing inequality. Canada, I'm sorry, is known around the world as, as a planet wrecker. Canada was the fourth largest oil and gas producer in the world in 2022 and also ranked among the top five worst countries in terms of new oil and gas extraction approved for development. Many of the new oil and gas projects around the world are actually Canadian companies, and Canada's on track to be the world's second largest developer of new oil and gas extraction from 2023 to 2050, which would make Canada alone responsible for 10% of new planned expansion. So what happens here is of vital importance to the whole planet. The second pillar of the non-proliferation treaty is a fair phase out, a fair plan for the wind down of existing fossil fuel production where nations with the capacity and historical responsibility for emissions transition the fastest, providing support to others around the world. So which countries are historically responsible for climate change? So typically we tend to compare current emissions between countries and then people look at China and India and they're like, oh, but they have produced so much. But you actually have to look at the, the history of who has used up the biggest amount of our budget of carbon emissions. So here we can see that if we are to remain under 1.5 degrees, we only have a carbon budget of 14% that's left. 
that 86% of our carbon budget has been chowed by these countries that you see here, United States, China, Russia, and Canada down there at the bottom. That is an incredible injustice. That means that 86% has already been used and all the other countries, including these, have only got 14% left to use. So it means that there is a need for reparations. People need to pay back and assist other countries to transition. So the first concept is loss and damage. Now, loss and damage is not charity. Loss and damage is not a loan. Loss and damage is a reparation for the damage already done. It's like when the church in England says, we recognize that a lot of the wealth of the Church of England comes from slavery. We did the damage, we became rich because of it, so we will pay reparations for the damage already done. And some of those losses, like we have seen in the video, can never be paid back. Some of the losses are losses of homelands and cultures where small island states are now sinking and people are having to move to other countries, like some of the small island states having to move to, to New Zealand. Some of it is loss of cultures. You lose the place where your ancestors were buried. Who pays for the incredible damage to infrastructure? This is the city of Beira in Mozambique, um, who was destroyed. It was the first uh, city that they went down in history as the first city to be completely destroyed by climate change when um, Cyclone Adai came in. They began to rebuild in Mozambique, rebuilding some of the, the roads, some of the schools. And then two years later, Hurricane Freddy came in. And again, some of those places were destroyed. And all that those Mozambicans were left with is the debt because they took out loans to rebuild. What happens when, when an entire crops and farmers' crops are wiped out and the land can no longer be farmable because it's now salty? Who can pay for those reparations for the damage already done? Surely it should be the countries that have caused it by their carbon emissions. And then the second type of, of um, finances is fair climate financing. First of all, for adaptation to prepare countries for the changes that will happen due to climate change. This is the island of Tuvalu. You can see how low lying it is, how close to the ocean it is. The only way they would be able to survive would be by putting in massive seawalls. Where would the money come for that? How do countries become prepared for disasters? Like the people in Libya, many of them didn't know that the, the, the dams had burst. 60% of um, the population of Africa has no disaster preparedness. They wouldn't know if a cyclone was coming. How do we adapt for the agricultural changes in, in massive drought? Where's the water harvesting? Who's going to pay for that? And then, of course, mitigation, which is a benefit to the entire planet. If Africa moves to renewables, the entire planet benefits. How do we shift to renewables? How do we improve public transport? But the climate financing must be fair. Currently, um, the developing nations can pay five to, five to eight times more in interest than northern countries for the loans that they take. And that is an injustice. So not only have they caused the damage, now they are saying that countries have to pay massive interest rates to begin to the shift. So the third pillar is the just transition. It's a fast track of the adoption of clean energy and economic diversification away from fossil fuels so that no worker, no community and no country is left behind. We have to think about the coal communities. One of the reasons why um, Trump was able to defeat Hillary Clinton in the early days is that he went and he visited the coal communities, he heard the coal communities, and he said, Trump digs coal. So if we don't listen to the coal communities, then they will be pushed to support politicians that we may not particularly like. So we have to listen to the coal communities. South Africa is very heavily dependent on coal. The trade unions were the backbone of the support for the ANC. So how do we hear, how do we bring a message of hope to the coal communities? And 
what what is happening about green minerals now everybody's talking about the move towards renewable and these minerals now it's a, a positive for africa because many of those minerals are in africa but they are not green minerals they have environmental impacts they have human rights impacts here's a picture of children in the drc in the congo who are digging for coltan which is uh, the mineral that is in most of our cell phones what kind of working conditions will people who are getting these green minerals be working in and who pays for this transition are we going to leave massive debts for the generations to come that is an issue of intergenerational justice and most importantly where does the manufacture take place is the transition to green energy going to take place by importing solar panels from china or will we make our own solar panels in the areas where the coal jobs are being lost? We have to have stories of hope for those communities with, with the coal areas. In South Africa now, I was just telling Beth, they've just started a little factory, a women-run only factory making solar panels. Well, those are little pockets of hope that can bring hope to, to um, coal communities. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 says, choose life. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you. I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life. I want to end with a quote by Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. Here is where the turning point must occur. Will we allow fear to paralyze us or use it to galvanize us into action? Only one path leads to hope, the other leads to despair. It is only our actions that offer the chance of a better future. The giant boulder of climate action isn't sitting at the bottom of an impossibly steep hill with only a few hands trying to push it up. But rather it's already at the top and rolling down the hill with millions of hands pushing it in the right direction. That gives us hope. It isn't going fast enough yet. But for every new hand that joins, it will go a little faster. Every action matters. Every choice matters. Let us choose life. And one of those actions that we can take is to sign the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, on the website, they say six nation states have already signed up. I think it's more now. But there's over 2,000 civil society organizations, 89 cities, and over 600,000 individuals who have endorsed and signed. So we can get our municipalities to sign, our churches to sign, our denominations to sign, our different organizations to sign. It is an action that we can take, an action that will bring hope and begin to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, and I just uh, put uh, the link in the chat to sign the treaty as an individual, but um, we will get into a few more resources shortly. Um, but thank you so much uh, for that overview and um, for making the kind of really salient connections to, to what's happening um, on the earth. Um, we're going to open it up for with a few questions. And while folks are maybe just framing their questions, um, uh, you can, again, uh, you can ask your question in the chat or use the raise hand function and we'll call on you. Um, but maybe I will just start with one, um, which is uh, wondering if you could just share a little bit about your experience bringing a motion to a big faith institution, like to the Anglican Consultative Council, um, and whether you faced challenges in bringing that about or whether there was already kind of momentum and traction to um, accept that motion and 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 accept that resolution um and if there's any strategies you can share with folks here that um may be able to kind of do a similar um bring a similar motion to their own church body here in canada thank you um yeah so it was the anglican consultative council in ghana and i think one of the most important things is is who do you get um to speak and to to sign up so you you can do your preparation and um, so i obviously prepared a powerpoint and i had some of the facts and the figures and explained what it was um but then i was quite careful in in choosing the 
people because I was just a visitor I wasn't a, a rep from the provinces so so the person who is going to propose and second the motion it's quite important that you choose people I think choose people I mean you it, it was quite good because it was like five days in from the conference so I was able to kind of suss out who are the people who are a good speakers and who've also got credibility um we had uh they had visited um some of the places where the slaves had been in Ghana and there was a very powerful uh, priest who was from uh, Barbados and who'd spoken really passionately and I was like wow this guy um it's very passionate he's making the links between environmental justice and and racism and environmental racism um so so i think yeah when if you're going to bring a resolution to your dio your diocese or your um your your church or something uh, yeah to think about who who will speak with this issue with passion um you can prepare the science and you can prepare the, the slides that say what the treaty is and you know whatever but I, you need to have couple of people are going to speak to it that are, that are coming with the right voices and coming that are sort of difficult people to to vote against really <laughs> um yeah and then also just to link up to you know because so you know the archbishop would have said certain things um so to link up you quote the archbishop always does well quote your bishop or whatever if you're speaking and try and try and link in with stuff that has already been discussed so it's not like you're coming you're coming with something new like i was able to also say well the Angli the african bishops where we really need um gas and oil are saying no to new oil and gas so try and um yeah build on things that have already been maybe passed at previous resolutions and um also if you can find other dioceses or other denominations it's very powerful if you can come and say because i was able to say well the world council of churches has already signed up on this and mentioned other other um, people that had already so do a little bit of um homework in terms of which other churches or denominations have already signed up and then you can mention those names and that always really helps as well that's great thanks and you touched on just at the end there a, a point that i was going to make earlier um just about uh just the, the endorsements that i do know from faith groups in canada that are kind of connected within the kairos network and within the kind of ecumenical network and so um, you can see those on the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty website, um, but um, I'd be happy to kind of put that list together for folks. But um, uh, I do know the World Council of Churches, as Rachel just mentioned, um, obviously the Anglican Communion, um, as she's just called. But I know um, I know uh, the Climate Action Working Group uh, from the Mennonite Church Canada um, has endorsed and uh, there's religious orders, Sans Cobla and the Sisters of St. Joseph and others. Um, the Lao Tse movement, um, uh, student Christian movement. There are kind of um, many within our within our our orbit that we can kind of build momentum with already, and then reach out to others. Um, there's a few questions coming in. Um, one from Carla: What is the best way we can help stop the demand for fossil fuels? I think the okay. best way. To the demand for fossil fuels is to make them more expensive um so we've got to stop the subsidizing of fossil fuels i mean if we if we could stop the subsidizing of fossil fuels then i mean it, it it's already the renewables are already cheaper um so if we can stop the 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 subsidies then they it it just we need to get to the point where it is a no-brainer when nobody's going to want to touch fossil fuels because they're too expensive. I think we have to face the fact that there's a small percentage of the planet that are willing to make sacrifices and will say, I will reduce my carbon footprint and I won't do this and I won't do that. That's a small, they're too small. What we need to do is we need to make fossil fuels so expensive that everybody will say, I don't want to touch them. And we're getting there. We are, we are almost there, but we need to speed it up. And I think the most important thing will be to do everything we can. I don't know if you saw what happened in Holland over the last few days. So exciting. 25,000 people took to the streets to say, let us stop um, subsidizing fossil fuels. Absolutely brilliant. And the police were so the police were busy arresting. They arrested a thousand people. They used water cannons. And then the police said, politicians, you've got to sort this out because this isn't a um, it's not like a, le a law thing it is a political thing and you have got to sort it out otherwise people are going to keep protesting 
so I think number one, we've got to get rid of the, we've got to make fossil fuels expensive. And the only way we can do that is taking the subsidies off because they are, they are, it's pushing, it's, it's pushing them to make them too cheap. And then I think the other thing as personally we can do as individuals, we can make absolutely darn sure that none of our money is going to fossil fuels, whether it is our pension schemes, whether it is the church's money, let us stop um, giving the moral um, support to fossil fuels. The Church of England, after a lot of battling by um, church members, has divested from fossil fuels. And it was very fascinating for me to see where that was reported. It was reported in the Financial Times. It was, a, I mean, it, although the Church of England money is not huge, it's got a lot of uh, moral weight. So I think if, if each one of us can go and have the conversation with your financial advisor, I don't want my pensions in fossil fuels. If you can push your church to take their money, maybe you need to change banks. Uh, we need to put pressure on banks. Also, a lot of um, insurance companies now are saying that they're particularly coal. People do not want to put money into coal. Um, so we can, we can speak to our, our financial advisors. And also, yeah, so look at your bank. Is your bank financing fossil fuel projects and, and threaten them, be willing to move? Uh, what is your pension scheme doing? And put as much pressure on um, on on the the um, reduction of the fossil fuel subsidies. I think those would be the main ones. All right, thank you. Um, I have two folks wondering um, if you're willing to one share your your slides, but if if folks could um, kind of use them in their own presentations um, with sure. context or yeah. Yeah, the, the thing is, it's quite big, so I can very happily send it to Beth as a wee transfer. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure how you would get it to other people, but I'll, I'll send it to Beth and she, and she can see what she can do. But, but it's rather large, so maybe people should ask you and then you can send it to them. Okay. Otherwise, I can send it as a PDF, but then it's difficult for you to reuse. But I'm happy to send it to, to Beth and she can do the techie stuff. Sure, sure. That's mm -hmm. great. Um, and we have a question from Martin. Over to you, Martin. Thank you. Uh, although I had to put my question in the chat. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, I just saw. Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. How can we decolonize the mineral fossil fuels extraction and development for green energy? Yeah, that's a very big one. You know, I mean, it. it I was saying the other day to somebody, it's like the the tr we want a just transition. The transition is happening. I mean, we're moving from fossil fuels to renewable energy. But the big danger is it becomes another colonial issue where the big um, North American, the big European companies make all the profit. I mean, for instance, if you look at Africa, Africa's got everything. We have got so we've got the sun, we've got the wind, we've got the green minerals. Now, we should be able to look back in 20 years time and say renewable energies took Africa out of poverty. Um, or will we look back and say renewable, the renewable transition made Europeans more rich and Africa more poor? Um, and I think I think the key thing is how do we decentralize um, renewable energy? So, for instance, what's happening now in South Africa, which has been exciting, is they've just brought in the feed-in tariff. So now with the feed-in tariff, you can have lots and lots of small solar um, projects or farms, a community, a school, a church can actually be generating energy for profit. Uh, you don't need a big company coming in. You can do it yourself. A small company will put the solar and then the, then the profit comes to the community or the church or the school. What we don't want is Shell finally deciding that they can make more money out of renewables than they're making out of oil. And then saying, oh, we're going to come in and build the massive solar farms and we will make the profit from that. So so the, it, it, you're right, Martin, we, we are at a crossroads and it's a very dangerous crossroads because we could go the wrong way where this becomes another colonialist extraction. Um, the minerals from Africa get taken, the, the profit from the solar energy gets taken and shareholders in Switzerland and New York and Toronto get richer and richer. Um, so I think it, 
it it's yeah it, that's a very huge question how do you how do you limit capitalism big question and um, but i think we have to look at how we can decentralize and particularly solar energy can be decentralized um yeah big question that one thanks rachel and thank you martin for that question um, thank you very much uh, thank you uh this is only one little piece of, of that very, very large undertaking, but um, there, there are many groups in Canada calling for corporate accountability of uh, Canadian uh, mining companies uh, working abroad. Um, and uh, that is just one kind of piece um, that we can push here is to ensure that those, um, as Rachel mentioned, you know, the, the reputation of Canadian companies um, is not great um, overseas. Um, and what we can be doing here is um, is is ensuring that corporate accountability is taken into into place. And so we we'd be happy to share some links about that particular piece. But I know that's just one part of a very large conversation around decolonization. Um, are there other questions? Oh yes, okay. I see a few more. Um, uh, okay, a question from Jim. Alluding to helping coal mining com communities building solar panels in the presentation, a proverbial elephant in the room is how do environmentalists cooperate with organized labor and indigenous leadership to address the day-to-day -day economic issues of working class people to build a much larger allyship and coalitions for action for systemic change or for system change? So big question. Yeah, there. that's Around a very, very good question. I, th I think that, I mean, one one of the key things that we've seen is, I mean, for talking from a South African context, is you had you had the environmental movement, which tended to be sort of middle class, mostly white people. And then you had the social justice movements. And it's not until social justice and environmental movements come together and, and where they come together is around environmental racism. Um, then, then the two the two streams come together, like the theme for season of creation. The, the river, the rivers of justice, have to flow together, and I think I think the coming together is is around environmental um, racism and environmental injustice, and then the issues of working class people, which is predominantly your your coal mining areas. Um, yeah, I think it, it's it's about building relationships and and you know, not speaking about them, but speaking with them. I mean, I've been to meetings that are discussing coal and there's not a single miner in the room. And you're like, how do you discuss this concept where you're not, you've got nobody from the affected community? And it's very easy to say, oh, it's such a dirty um, industry, you know, and people will have better jobs. And people are like, I will have no job. <laughs> like, I want my job. Um, so I, I feel like nothing, that principle of nothing about us without us. And I think sometimes in NGOs and environmental movements, we're a bit guilty of that, that we talk about people rather than having them in the room and discussing and actually really learning. Um, I mean, and as I mentioned, you know, like I think when Trump and Hillary Clinton were standing against each other and they said that she never went to those areas because she presumed they would vote for her and she didn't listen to their fears of the loss of coal was one of the issues that made her lose. Um, yeah, so so what is the yeah, working class people, organized labor and indigenous leadership? How do we bring those three together is a very, very big question. But I think I think it has you have I think you just have to try and and listen listen more and talk less somehow try and really understand the issues and why why people and um one of the things i remember speaking to somebody from the sierra club once and it was it was about um about uh coal closing down a coal power station and they said we never talk about climate change we talk about children um because we we all care about our children we all care about our children's health we all care about the future, and I think if one can 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 come together around the intergenerational injustice thing, and what kind of world do we want our kids to have? Do we want our kids to grow up close to coal mining where they they they're getting um, chest problems and health issues? Um, do we want our children to grow up where where every you know the 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 forests burn every year? 
what what future do we want for our kids? So some of finding finding something that we can um, come together with. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for that. Um, uh, we have maybe just time to, to read out one more kind of question. Um, it's a bit of a question maybe to the room, um, but uh, from, from Laura and, uh, and then we'll just, uh, I'll, I'll kind of wrap things up with some resourcing and, and closing. Um, but Laura, Laura writes, I live in Saskatchewan and our government along with Alberta is, is perceived both nationally and internally as immovable internationally is immovable in its support for ongoing fossil fuel use and expansion. However, uh, I just saw a story this morning saying there is public support in Alberta for an emissions cap, um, a current policy controversy. I'm wondering if we can promote the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty with emphasis on making the phase out global. So that's maybe a strategy to, to us in Canada. A common refrain here is the, is the whataboutism that says, why should we do it when others are not? Um, I think it is a tricky argument to make, especially when we want to look at historical emissions and capacity to share, but we have to try. Laura, did you want, yeah, do you want to add to that? Um, I just, I just a correction. I did mean internally that. Oh, you did? Sorry. Okay. My bad. People here think mm -hmm. that we can't move. Right. And this um, story just this morning echoes things that I've seen other places that people underestimate how much support there is for among their own neighbors for for action. So that, um, any final thoughts from you, Rachel, before I? Um... On the question of the um, the emissions cap, um, I'm not quite sure exactly what that would mean. Would that mean that Alberta was allowed to emit up to a certain amount, but? other states were not or i mean no, i don't it's, i'm not really it's too it, yeah it's a that policy I, alberta has a cap on its books that's never been implemented that would basically in effect halt the oil sands eventually because they would run out of room in this budget and i believe the current controversy is is to implement a national emissions cap mm -hmm. um so they're they're related to the fossil fuel non-proliferation, but what I was getting at is that we seem to have this. It it's a it's a federal um, challenge. Is that Alberta and Saskatchewan oppose what a lot of the rest of the country wants to do? Um, mm -hmm. But I wonder whether a, we could make significant inroads by putting it in terms of fossil fuel non-proliferation globally and saying it's not mm -hmm. that we want to handicap ourselves it's that we want to be part of a global effort and mm -hmm. that would be fair it wouldn't be us halting while china keeps building on building coal plants which is what you commonly hear from people here is why should we do it when um, others are not Mm -hmm. I mean, Ch China's transition is absolutely incredible. Actually, I mean, they 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 probably going to end up saving the planet. I mean, they they are transitioning very very fast. I mean, do you do you feel that the regular Canadian person in Alberta or Saskatchewan are they not making the link with the wildfires and climate change? Is it just yeah. like oh, there's but, fires? Oh. It it's tricky. Um, mm -hmm. I, again with this poll it suggests that it's more nuanced than the social media for example would suggest mm -hmm. um there there are a lot of people and i've run into them personally who are saying well the wildfires are being set deliberately by environmentalists and so oh. people are in these information <laughs> bubbles that they're being fed really um wow awful things and they're they're buying it um mm -hmm. so yeah it's it's really it's really challenging and disturbing but i i think there is a big middle of people who really don't know what to believe and they're mm -hmm. hearing both and they're they're just not sure mm -hmm. sure um yeah. with that yeah that is that is our our uphill boulder to push <laughs> mm, I think yeah I was talking to Rachel a bit earlier about that movable middle which um I think uh yeah our energies can 
can be put there. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I just no noticed that we only have a few few more minutes together. And um, I just wanted to share some some resources and kind of put a question to the room here. Um, uh, so one, I've, I've shared the the link to endorse um, as an individual, but then um, as, as, as Rachel mentioned, there are kind of those next steps to then um, seek endorsement from um, a, a bigger body within your community, your church, um, your national church, uh, your city council. Um, and uh, so we, I'd like to know um, within this room, within this group here, um, maybe what your what you feel that you would like to explore as an action to kind of go beyond that ind individual endorsement um, and how might we at the National Kairos Office help to support that. So um, I've heard one thing where let's share Rachel's slides and that can be used as a tool in your communication. So I'd be happy to um, put that slide together uh, and wonder if it would be helpful for there to be kind of um, some additional Canadian specific things within that presentation. Um, uh, would examples of motions be helpful or um, a letter uh, kind of within a Canadian context to decision makers? Um, if there's something that you're really looking for, maybe just put it, it right in the chat. And if you can't think on the spot right now, just send me an email later. Um, but uh, we are, uh, Shannon and I uh, have been in conversation to um, to build out a, a web page on the Cairo site um, about the treaty um, and linking to some of these resources. So we will do that. Um, but in the meantime, I'm just going to share a link uh, to the campaign materials page from the treaty network um, and some of the resources that you'll find there. Um, so I'm just putting that in the chat now. Um, yeah, so there, there's, there's campaign materials and within that there's an amplification pack. Um, there's a guide to meet with political representatives. That's a very kind of global um, uh, resource, but uh, we'll probably have some um, some relevant uh, things for, for Canadians. Um, there's, uh, you can ask your MP to sign the parliamentarians call um, and you can see which MPs have already signed onto that. Uh, with the link and then there's just some 10 more fun ways maybe to um, create momentum and uh, using some creativity to support the treaty. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, if you do have ideas, if you want to save the chat uh, with all these links right now, at the bottom of your screen, there's there's a three underneath the chat window, there's three little dots. And if you just click on that or right click on that, it should say save chat, but don't you worry. I'm going to follow up with all of them in an email. So if that's, uh, um, and some folks have asked for the, yes, there will be a recording that we will circulate around. So you can certainly use the recording of um, the, uh, uh, yeah, you can use the recording um, with, with you, within your activities. Um, and I'm just seeing, yes, the presentation, including who has signed on. Yes, that's good. Um, print out of the slides. Yes, we can make that happen. Um, and yes, and then focus on some regional, yeah, conversation around Roblox. So again, um, this is a beginning of a conversation. We had an event earlier this week where some, some interesting points were raised about the Canadian context um, and kind of continuing that here. So we are happy to facilitate um, more space for conversations around the treaty um and a letter to churches so that's great we'll start pulling all of those resources together and communicate that with you um and just wanted to finally uh close one with a, a big thank you to reverend rachel mash for joining us uh today um our afternoon and her evening uh really grateful for your presence and uh just to to note that uh, we are in the middle of climate action week and it continues uh, tomorrow and through the weekend. Uh, on today's blog uh, on the Kairos website, we're exploring connections between climate justice and migrant justice with an invitation to the regularization for all day of action on Sunday, September 17th. So check that out. And there's a link to um, the day of action page with uh, a map of, or I think it's a list of where actions are taking place across the country. On the blog tomorrow, we're going to have a reflection from uh, Yusra Shafi, uh, who had a recent experience at the Parliament of the World's Religions, um, leading some climate discussion there. 
And uh, it's been noted in the chat, but yes, this year's global climate strike actions will take place um, uh, from Friday tomorrow, September 15th through Sunday, September 17th with actions across the country. And I'm just gonna share the link to the Fridays for Future map. Um, if you don't already have plans to attend an action in your community, you should be able to find more details on those actions here. And I think that brings us to the end. That's everything. So thank you so much for your contributions today, for the questions um, and for being with us. Thank you, Beth and Rachel so thank much. You. Thank you so here. much. Thank you, Beth. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.